I want to say more about Mustafa Said as a reverse conqueror. This aspect of the text is, is troubling. Um, troubling from a feminist perspective. Because we get these really violent descriptions of not only the murder and the relationship with Jane Morris, but also the abuse and um, manipulation of these other white women, Anne Hammond, um, Isabella Seymour, and Sheila Greenwood. We also, of course, get their racism and exoticization in Mustafa Saeed, so they're hardly sympathetic characters. In many ways, you could say that the seduction of these English women works as a kind of allegory for the conflict between colonizer and colonized. But it's much more complicated than just a, a violent conflict, right? Because within this, we have a sense of attraction and repulsion um, between Mustafa Saeed and these women. And that the attraction that he feels for Englishness because of the way that he's absorbed colonial ideology is at one with his repulsion of it and his rejection of it. Just as the attraction that she rolled Greenwood and Hammond Isabel Seymour have for Mustafa Saeed because they've indulged in imperialist fantasies and Orientalism, is also one and the same as the racism and white supremacy that they uphold and you know enact. So this gives us, this allegory gives us a really nuanced and complicated idea of what exactly imperialism is um, and the kind of complexity of that attraction revulsion from both parts of the dynamic, both the colonizer and the colonized. Now, Eugene Morris seems to represent more, uh, um, you know, kind of the, the violent aspect of colonial power struggle. These other women commit suicide because they were so distraught over their relationship with Saeed. It's a, it's a little vague. Yeah, there are a lot of ways to interpret that. I think you could argue that their suicides are metaphors for the self-destructiveness of white supremacy um, in all of its guises. Whereas the murder of June Morris, you know, is, is interesting because it's a murder, but it's also described as self-willed. Right? And she's described as having plunged the knife into her own chest, kind of forcing him to do it. Again, this is you know deeply troubling, and it's in a part of a sexual act as well. Um, so this idea of you know she wanted it, it's it is this triggering for you. I don't blame you. It's it's quite disturbing, and maybe it's even really problematic as a metaphor for imperialism. Nevertheless, I think that it can be read this way. You know, her self-willed de death maybe is a metaphor for the way in which England is in this moment of the twilight of its empire, but still is going to maintain control even in its demise, right? Because insofar as she guides her own murder and then kind of haunts Sonny for as long as he lives, she maintains control over him just as the former colonizer means control over the formerly colonized. So there's a neo-colonial dimension as well to her death and her kind of sense of lingering presence. I want to read this quote from Mustafa Saeed. It's on page 79. It's from a much longer passage that I would like you to pay attention to. But this is where he is on trial for the murder and the suicides of these other women. He says, the ships that first sailed down the Nile carrying guns, not bread, and the railways were originally set up to transport troops. The schools were started so as to teach us how to say yes in their language. They imported to us the germs of the greatest European violence, as seen on the Somme and at Verdun, the likes of which the world has previously never known, the germ of a deadly disease that struck them more than a thousand years ago. This, my dear sirs, sorry, yes, my dear sirs, I came as an invader into your very homes, a drop of poison which you have injected into the veins of history. I would encourage you to go back and look at those opening pages of Heart of Darkness and see how this idea of the germ of empire, the disease, the idea of what happened a thousand years ago in the veins of history 
seems to be in dialogue with those opening pages of Heart of Darkness. Ultimately, here, Mustafa is saying to his accusers, if I am murderous, if I have invaded you and taken your own, you, you, you push them to destruction, it is because you taught me to be this way. But there's also a sense in which it's kind of an inevitable playing out of the dynamic of course. I want to say something about Orientalism and the seduction of Isabella Seymour. This is on page 33, but a very similar dynamic is carried out in his other in seductions of the other women. And it has to do with the question of him being a lie and the way that she plays along with it. He says on page 33, I related to her fabricated stories about the deserts and golden sands and jungles where non-existent animals called out to one another. I told her that the streets in my country teemed with elephants and lions and during siesta time crocodiles crawled through it. Half credulous, half disbelieving, she listened to me, laughing and closing her eyes, cheeks reddening. Sometimes she would hear me out in silence, a Christian sympathy in her eyes. There came a moment when I felt I had transformed in her eyes into a naked, primitive creature, a steer in one hand and arrows in the other, hunting elephants and lions in the jungle. This was fine. Curiosity had changed to gaiety and gaiety to sympathy, and when I stir the pools in its depths, the sympathy will be transformed into a desire upon whose taut strings I shall play as I wish. Mustafa Saeed has come to understand the stereotypes, the projections, the racism, the Orientalism that is put upon him. He has come to understand it so well that he wields it, right, to his benefit, and he controls it. At least he thinks he does, kind of up to a point. One could argue that in the process of doing so, it is also very psychologically da damaging for him. But it is psychologically damaging for both of them. You know, her suicide and his compulsion to lies and seduction and eventually and the sexualized violence with, is with G. Morris is part of this dynamic in which um, there is this deep alienation from himself as much as he is alienated from British society because of this, you know, this kind of exoticization. The self-exoticization forces him to think he's in control and really he's participating in racist power structures, even in the moments that he thinks that he is on top of it, right? Um, so it's, it's ambiguous, it's ambivalent, and it really depends on your interpretation, but I think that no one comes at it as dynamic, scot-free. It's destructive for both of them, even though he thinks he's in charge at first. There's a parallel narrative in the novel, which is the narrative of Hosna but Mahmoud's murder-suicide. So we learn, you know, finally at the very end of the novel, how exactly Jean Morris dies. Um, but it's sort of dropped in very early on. Um, we are following the story of what's going on in England and the Jor period from Mustafa Saeed. But in the present day of the novel, in which Mustafa Saeed is recounting his story to the end of the narrative, we have this other kind of series of problems and conflicts. And this is a really interesting aspect of the novel. Um, and I think it is this aspect of the novel that explains why it was banned in Sudan. Um, because it's not just the sexual violence that takes place in England, but that which takes place at home that makes the novel extremely critical. We get these regular meetings of the narrator's grandfather and the characters of Wad Reyes and Bint Majub. And what's interesting about Bint Majub is that she is an old woman who's sort of allowed to be uh, like a man. You know, she's very brash. She criticizes all the men around her. She's kind of vulgar. Um, and when she is in conversation with these other men, 
there's often debates around traditional values versus the direction that Sudan is moving in, so like more modern Sudanese culture, and especially gender roles and sexuality. In fact, there's a long discussion, relatively long discussion, on page 67 to 69 about female circumcision. Yeah, and these three characters discuss and debate it. This seems almost out of place in the novel, that it's sort of just thrown in there. Um, but I think this is a good example of an effort to represent internal debate, post-colonial internal debate in the text. Kind of like the sort of internal debate that we see where the characters like Obnerita and things fall apart. So pay attention to that when you see it in their discussion. Of course, the main point of contention is going to be Wadais' insistence on marrying Hosna bin Hormu. Now, she has been Mustafa Saeed's wife after she returned to Sudan. Mustafa Saeed drowns in the river, and shortly after he dies, Wadais wants to marry her. She doesn't want to marry him, which makes him insist on marrying her. It is... It, in every sense of forced marriage, she has no way out of it because of her standing as a woman in the village. The narrator, interestingly, is really the only one who is adamantly opposed to it. Several of the characters think it's not such a great idea, trying to discourage him from doing it, but there's only the narrator who is really opposed to it and troubled by it. Whether this is because he is in love with Hosnam but Lamrud, or because he is just put off by the idea of a forced marriage because he's you know, a modern man, educated in England, etc. Um, is a little unclear, but it can be both at once, I think. Because remember, he is asked by Ben Bamud and encouraged by other characters to marry her himself. That would be the way out. She likes him, they get along. You could just have a kind of de facto marriage with her. But the problem is that he is already married. And although it is perfectly normal in a traditional sense for him to have multiple wives, he seems to really reject that idea and have a certain amount of disdain for it um, because it doesn't sit with his idea or of what his modern, perhaps even hybrid British Sudanese sensibilities, what, you know, suggest that she should do. So he doesn't act. He does nothing. He tries to persuade Wadrais that he's unsuccessful. And it's precisely his unwillingness to act that forces her to marry him and then leads to Wadrais's murder. Bint Mahmoud, of course, murders Wadrais. She castrates him. And then she kills herself. And this is described in pretty little detail, page 103 to 106. I wonder, though, if we could say that his, the narrator's unwillingness to intervene is really a consequence of colonialism and post-colonialism. Because his hybrid post-colonial identity puts him kind of in between those two worlds. And he doesn't have any standing to really intervene in any meaningful sense. And he's unwilling to do what it would take to actually prevent this from happening. In many ways, you could say that that Mamun's murder-suicide murder is absolute indictment of traditional patriarchal culture in the village and in Sudan as a whole. And it is absolutely an act of feminist defiance. I mean, she castrates him, right? And... Um, in some ways, you can say that this character, even in her death and desperation, calls out to the new Sudanese woman of the 60s or a new kind of like Arabic feminism that's emerging in the 60s in North Africa and the Middle East. So um, she's, she's maybe the, the ultimate hero of the novel, even as a tragic figure. Okay, finally, I want us to look at this room that Mustafa Saeed has secretly kept, the rectangular room. After Mustafa Saeed dies, we know that he kept this room and that we don't know exactly what is in it. And the nameless narrator has the keys to it and he puts off going into the room. 
until after the death of Hosnant and Mahmoud. And finally, kind of in this moment of destruction, self-destructiveness and desperation, he decides to go into the room and see what's there. And what he finds is, well, it's a library. Um, it's, a, it's a room full of artifacts of his life in England, you know, letters, books, paintings, etc. But what's really striking to him about it, what's uncanny and sort of bizarre about it, is that it seems to have completely recreated a Victorian study, you know, with the carpets and the nice chairs and the candelabra, all in the fireplace, etc. So I've given you kind of an image of what at least I imagine this room might look like. And it's interesting to compare this description of the room, which you'll find on page 113, with that of his London apartment on page 121. And I've given you a picture of what we might imagine his London apartment to be. You know, he describes how he kind of tricked it out in all of this exoticizing Orientalist decoration, much of which is totally incoherent that does not reference his. Sudanese culture at all, but it's kind of a hodgepodge of certain fantasies of the Middle East and Africa. You know, the sandalwood and sort of kinds of paintings, etc. And he uses all of these trappings of Orientalism to seduce these women so they can kind of fall into this reverie and fantasy of being part of his so-called harem. The room that he keeps in London is a lie right, in this artificial construct of his identity. And the room that he keeps in Sudan, the secret locked British room, is also kind of a lie. I mean, it's so contrived. It's sort of the inversion or the opposite of the room in London. So, you know, these descriptions of the two rooms that are just about 10 pages apart set a really interesting foil for the complexity of his character. And we learn that the narrator, you know, initially wants to burn the room. He's upset by its presence. He says on page 112, was this the action of a man who wanted to turn over a new leaf? Well, if he really wanted to just leave England behind, why would he come back and construct all of this and never tell anyone about it? The narrator says, I shall bring the whole place down upon his head. I shall set it on fire. And he does. He sets a corner of the carpet on fire. But we learn that at the very end, in the final chapter, that I had put out the candles and locked the door in the room and out of the courtyard without doing anything. Another fire would not have done any good. I left him talking and went out. This voice of Mustafa Zayed kind of haunting him. I thought of throwing away the key where nobody could find it. And I decided against it, meaning this act. I'm interested in your interpretation of that. Why would it be a meaningless act? Can one really destroy the library, the colonial library? To think back of on you know, Nguvi's insistence on decolonizing the mind, is it would it be possible if this whole room went up in a fire, would that solve the problem? For the narrator you know, of colonial education and identification as a whole, perhaps that's why it would be a meaningless act. On the other hand, we know that the narrator is consistently unwilling to act and kind of caught in a place of indecision because of his hybrid post-colonial identity. So we might also read that with a little suspicion that even he could bring himself to burn all those beautiful English books. In the final pages of the novel, we get what is, in effect, a suicide attempt on the part of the narrator. Just like Mustafa Saeed drowned in the Nile, the narrator who produces or replicates that by winging into the Nile. Um, on page 138 to 139, we get a really interesting series of uh, metaphors here in the Nile. And I want to read this part to you. He says, I found I was halfway between north and south. I was unable to continue, unable to return. 
Now, he's referring to the north and south banks of the river, but of course, we can read this much more broadly as between north, between Europe and south, between Africa. I was unable to continue. I was unable to return. I turned over on my back and stayed there motionless, with difficulty moving my arms and legs as much as was needed to keep me afloat. I was conscious of the river's destructive forces pulling me downwards, or of the current pushing me to the southern shore at a curtain angle. I would not be able to keep thus poised for long. Sooner or later, the river's forces would pull me down to its depths. And then on the next page, she says, suddenly, and then my mind cleared and my relationship to the river was determined. Though floating on the water, I was not part of it. I thought that if I died at that moment, I would have died as I was born without any volition of mine. And my life, all my life, I had not chosen and had not decided. Now I am making a decision. I choose life. But the comic actor shouting on the stage, I screamed with all my remaining strength. Help. Help. Of course, this is the final line of the novel. The fate of the narrator is unknown. You know, is he rescued from the water by someone on the shores in the village? Has, is he already too far gone? Um, has he waited too long to act? You know, has he been waiting in this place of indecision and conflicted identity for so long that He's remained between these two worlds for so long that he's lost all sense of self. And now he's going to lose his life halfway between north and south. I think his cry for help at the end of the novel is really a cry for post-colonial identity and agency for all of Sudan. Okay, I'm going to end here, but I look forward to reading your thoughts on the discussion board about this or any other aspect of this very complicated, very beautiful, and have to.